Sorry. That's no, okay. <laughs> so tonight we have quite a, a variety. We'll start off with Ed Yu is going to be talking about uh, transitioning from a, a compact uh, camera to a micro four thirds. Um, and I thought that would be a perfect topic here because I know there's a lot of you use the compact camera and if you're even thinking about changing to anything, this will uh, this should be helpful. And then Andrea uh, will do some of her favorite uh, pictures from any region or just in general? New England. New England, okay, good. And then uh, we leave New England and go down to the South Pacific for Don McDonald will show us some of the whales, uh, the humpback whales. So that should be a nice way to end. So uh, also if there's anyone that's uh, has any, any program they would like to do, there's an opening in April, no, May. So if anyone would like to do something, anything, whether it's uh, photo editing or just some photographs from, uh, from some trip or region, please uh, let me know or, or Whitney. Okay. So uh, for that, uh, Ed, I will let you uh, let you begin. Hey, hello. Sort of slideshow. Is that showing up correctly? I haven't done Zoom teaching in a long time. Oh, it's looking good. Cool. All right. So. Yeah, actually, this is going to be like the warm up during the chat, but I don't know if there's publicly available chat. But anyway, um, if it's possible, you can like sort of think about if you can put your number in one, three, or five. Um, this is very teacherly of me, just sort of thinking of like um, formative assessment um, where people are at. Like, are you using a compact camera? Are you uh, like Tom and have a medium format, an IMAX camera in the water? Or are you like at a three? Like, maybe I'm going to switch, either go down or up in that. Cool. Some of you have actually a lot of you guys have dove it, so this is kind of funny. Okay, awesome. So thanks for a couple of folks in the chat. So it looks like there's like actually a decent collection of folks um, using the compact camera um, and large sensor. So I'm going to call it like large sensor, even though micro four thirds is quite tiny compared to um, full frame and APS. Um, and that like there are people using like there must be medium format camera shooters underwater. Because I saw a $25,000 Nauticam house in months. So, boom, here we go. All right. So, this is my talk. I've had various different titles, um, but ultimately, um, you want to think about I, the goals of today's talks, like some learning objectives, is so you want to be able to compare and contrast some of the pros and cons of a compact camera and some of the bigger sensor cameras. I'm going to be mostly focusing on micro four thirds because that's what I could afford. Um, and then the other one is like, if you are at a one, you can like think about, I can evaluate what camera might be best for me, like either now or in the future. Um, so for the agenda, um, just like a little bit quick introduction of myself, the comparison of the two systems, and then a little bit of some of the photos that I've taken, um, both with the TG6 and the EM1 Mark III. Tom has all the toys, holy cow. All right. <laughs> All right, so this is not like a full comparison of the specs between the two different systems. You can easily just Google full frame versus compact underwater. You will get millions of different things. Um, and so um, the comparison is really going to be about uh, kind of like my initial experience with the system. Um, and then coming from like with the context of like, I am like, I've have like intermediate amount of experience doing photography on land um, and coming into that world. All right, so basically this talk is, so I just bought a camera and now I wanna talk about it. And that's what this talk is about. So um, hopefully if you are not interested or you have a full frame, go get your bathroom break and get ready for Andrea's talk. Um, if you are at that one and you're the TG6 user and you're kind of thinking about it, um, yeah, this talk maybe might resonate with you. Are there any questions before I begin? Sorry, very much a teacher, so. Do the uncomfortable wait time. All right, looks like not. All right, so a little bit of background about me. Um, in the 1990s, which I realized is much further than I realized by doing the math, um, I started shooting uh, with a Canon. 
uh, 35 millimeter. Um, okay, so I did not look at SLR. So SLRs and mirrorless, they both use like similar sensors now. Um, and it's basically, is there a mirror or not? Um, and so I'm not really gonna be talking about the differences between mirrorless and SLRs, but more focusing on this aspect of like a compact system versus a larger sensor system. And what I say would pull true for APS as well as full frame. And then the differences between an SLR and mirrorless underwater are fairly minute. Um, some of the advantages of mirrorless or DSLR underwater, I think go away just because um, it's really about the light and like a fairly show, show, a slow frame rate of uh, shooting just because of the challenges of strobe lighting. I'm gonna admit people. Um, cool. All right, this is much easier than teaching 14 year olds. Um, I don't have to like tell you, hey, put your PS5 away. All right, um, at that year, I also started scuba diving. Um, fast forward about 20 years, um, I bought my first uh, TG3, I believe. Um, I became a paddy dive master, diving in Utila. Um, and that really got me interested in like doing more photography underwater because I had been sort of like dive twice a year while on vacation. Um, and then after that experience, I'm like, okay, I really want to dive a lot more. So I got a TG6 and a really, really small strobe. And I regret not getting a nicer strobe back then. Boop. All right. Then uh, the pandemic hit and I became a local diver. Um, I had sworn never to dive again after my open water dive where I had one meter visibility. It was 40 degree water in an ill-fitting seven millimeter suit in the uh, mid nineties. Um, but because of COVID, I'm like, I can't travel. I can't do any of the things I like doing, but I love diving. So I was going to give it a try. Um, I dove with Steve Bigelow, um, actually at Fort Wetherill, I think it was one of the first dives with Metro West, and I got completely hooked. Um, during this time, I also got really interested in insect macro photography. Um, I ended up buying a Laowa 65 millimeter lens, which goes up to two times life size. I also bought a 25 millimeter Laowa lens that goes up to 5x life size, but it's such a difficult lens to use. Um, I actually don't really use that lens all that often, but I do recommend it. So if you are interested in insect uh, macro photography. That's actually like a really, it's a fairly inexpensive lens and it does uh, more than life size uh, magnification, which is really great. And then um, those two things combined. I then became really obsessed with underwater macro photography, combining the two um, interests. And these are just a couple of the photos that I took during uh, the pandemic. Um, these are like little, um, some of these are like weird orb spiders that like lived above the door of my neighbor who never cleans his doorway. Um, there's a jumping spider on the top right, which was underneath a brick right outside my house. Um, I think it's some sort of wasp. I can't quite remember on a hike with my kids. Bottom left is a dragonfly during a rainy summer day. It got really cold and couldn't move, which is the best for photography. And then the bottom right was this weird red beetle that was on a weed outside my house. So definitely like if you're interested in photography, like the backyard macro photography is amazing. All right. So. This is why this talk is not about full frame um, sensor cameras, because it's really expensive and the cost scale for the size of the sensor. Um, so like a compact system you can get with the housing for about 700 bucks and you are ready to go. And the entry from um, even the smallest larger sensor, Micro Four Thirds, um, can approach about $4,000 once you include the housing, the lens, the body, and it's quite expensive. And then it just gets worse from there or better, depending on like the size of your credit card limit. Um, and so for me, I chose to go micro four thirds. Um, I do have a full frame camera, but I could not afford the housing. So any questions about like the sensor size and pricing? These are all approximate. I kind of just looked at what I remember the port housing and the lenses and things like that costing. So cool. And these are not to perfectly to scale. I know Tom is um, looking at it and wondering why it's not quite right. So my hot take is bigger sensor, better photos. Am I right? Yeah, no? Oh, did they all the same pixel size? They do not. So difference, I'm uh, sorry, I can go back to the slide. Um, different cameras with the uh, same size sensor can have different amount of megapixels. So you can have a full frame camera with 45 megapixels and the pixels are actually fairly small compared to a full frame camera with 20 megapixels with really large uh, pixels. And so if you're trying to do things like astrophotography, you actually don't want that high megapixel count because that's gonna have a lot of noise. Um, and so that pixel size is something you'll have to like do spec comparisons based on 
the different camera systems and that depending on your interest, you do want to have high megapixels because you want to make large, huge enlargements or you want to be able to crop fairly excessively um, or you want to have large, fairly large pixels because you know that you want to do astrophotography or available light photography like handheld in dark areas. Does that answer your question, Charles? Awkward wait time. Okay. Boom. All right. Just kidding with, and this is actually Andrea's photo with this thing that is like the slug nudibranch. This is not a new camera. This is not a large sensor. Um, and it's not even a fancy strobe. So Andrea is actually gonna show her photos next in the next session. Um, and so like this really beautiful nudibranch, well, like beautifully lit, like in focus, everything's amazing, is not, a, um, does not require micro four third. So um, if that's something you're sort of like aching about, like, oh, I can't take good photos and then upgrading to micro four thirds will be the answer. And it's like, no, there are um, divers taking awesome photos with small systems. So undermining the entire point of this talk. <laughs> All right, so this is a slide from Tom. Um, he has this really neat talk where he talks about um, this triple intersection of how to take really great photos. And so this one's actually really focusing on the green circle of technical. Um, and not so much on the marine um, flora fauna or like the art of taking photography. Um, I'm going to show some of the photos I've taken that I think hit some of these intersections, borderline identification, maybe some lucky shots, and maybe pretty but boring. Um, but I don't know if I have the compelling images just yet. So there we go. I highly recommend the talk. I think he has it online somewhere. Oop. All right. So. Um, so this is sort of like a cause and effect brain frame. So thinking about the art and vision, which is the composition and post-processing skills. And I want to really emphasize that post-processing is a huge piece of making a good um, final, or not good, it's like can be a very like beautiful final image, can be pulled out of like not the most ideal photo. Um, and so um, again, if you're thinking about upgrading, don't just think about equipment, but think about the post-processing skills like Lightroom, Photoshop, and things like that. Um, again, the camera and the technical, like take lots and lots of photos because it's really hard and we'll talk about some of those challenges. Um, and finally, the flora and the fauna. Um, the most easy way to upgrade your photos is to dive with people who can find stuff. So if you have a dive buddy that dives slowly and can find amazing things, like that's the fastest way to make your photos better. Um, because they'll find it, they'll take photos, and then they'll like point that stuff. And you're like, okay, I should take a photo of that. So when you put all those three things together, you will get awesome photos. So again, post-processing, composition, taking a zillion shots, and having a good dive buddy. So um, why I fell in love with my TG6 camera, um, I love the simplified controls. Um, I was a fairly new diver compared to where, uh, where I think I am today. Um, and that's really important because task loading is um, both can cause accidents, which is really scary. And um, if you have complicated camera controls while you're trying to take photos, um, that can just make it really difficult to take good photos. And so um, having those simplified controls lets you really think about the composition as well as trying to find the actual critters that you want to take photos of. So um, I really like that aspect of the TG6. Um, the other one is that it allows you to do both wide, true wide angle and macro, so it's a do-it-all lens. Um, so if you swim by a mola mola that has a nudibranch riding on top of it, um, you can do you can take both photos using the same setup, and there's no limitation in terms of like what you can take photos of. There are aftermarket lenses like a, a wet lens, or um, that can do macro, or make it even more of a fisheye lens. But just within the basic um, built-in lens itself, you can take a wide variety of type of photos. So. Why upgrade when these are the problems with the photography, right? So we all know that you are in movement of the water, the subject is um, potentially moving, um, the strobes can be placed in infinite positions, cameras are heavy and cumbersome. And so that's kind of why most underwater photos are terrible, or at least that's why my, most of my photos are terrible, right? I've had trouble with buoyancy, um, I'm getting backscattered and everything, and just like lifting the camera and like comp I'm composing the shots is really, really hard. And in fact, a bigger system will make all these different factors even worse. And so um, just keep that in mind about um, when you're thinking about that system. But, um, 
but you know, I've had the camera system for about two months. And um, some of the things that I really love about it is that, yes, I have a manual mode now. Um, so I can change the aperture independently of the shutter speed and they are not linked. So with the TG6, um, you can change the aperture um, to make it higher to have like more depth of field, but there's three settings and that's it. And then you have, don't have a lot of independent control. Um, and that the other thing that I really enjoy about it is that with the macro lens, you have greater working distance. And so um, the microscope mode in TG6 is wonderful, but you have to be almost touching the subject. And for things that are shy um, um, or fast moving, like it's really hard to get your camera that close to take macro shots. Um, the other thing is that I noticed that um, with the larger sensor, there's less noise and they are just sharper images. Um, and both that's the quality of the lens as well as the larger sensor. And finally, when I, um, I can actually compose after the, after the dive. So I have more freedom to crop. I noticed with the TG6, if I had to do substantial cropping, it really made the images pixelated and limited how much I could enlarge the photos themselves. Um, but the thing that I really felt like has been the game changer that's made me happy with my purchase and not have buyer's remorse is that the autofocus. Um, that's an issue that I've had with the, um, the TG6 itself. And so um, I just skipped this off, that's okay. So my image, my, my problem with the TG6 was that its focusing is great because it has this microscope mo focusing mode, but it will actually focus on the silt that is on the housing port itself. And so a lot of New England dives, there's a lot of silt that floats in the water. And if it lands on your housing port and you don't notice it, um, it will lock focus on the housing port itself, and then it won't disengage from the housing port until you clear the port itself, or you completely zoom out, refocus, and then zoom back in. And that can make um, taking photos really difficult. The second thing that made it really challenging is that there's a lot of focus hunting. So um, a focus light helps, but even in low vis situations, um, the camera, because of its software, is not able to lock on focus as easily. Um, and it could be frustrating at times where you want, you have the shot you really want to take, um, like a squid that's moving around and the TG6 is not able to lock into the focusing very easily. And those are things that um, the micro four thirds is really, um, actually larger sensor cameras have much faster and more advanced autofocus systems and can lock into those things much more easily. Any questions in the chat? No? I, can I agree here? Um, oh, sure. Hi, I'm Asla. Sorry, I'm an intruder. I agreed 100% when I switched from my compact camera, Canon G16, to um, DSLR. Uh, now I'm using Nikon D700. All my dives in Fort Federal, I tried to take photos of the um, larval stage mantis. I did take some photos, but like probably two out of 100 would focus. The first day I dove with D700, DSLR, bam, I got focus on. That, that, I was like, yes, all like, I don't have to take any more pictures now. All the photos I needed are done now. <laughs> Sorry, Ed, I had to no. No, no. interfere and <laughs> share my annoyance with my, the only annoyance with my Canon D16 is that it's an amazing camera, but yeah, focus I realized was way slower. Yeah, and I, I don't know if that is the companies refusing to put in the nicer autofocus system into their cameras because they want to differentiate their products, or it truly is like a limitation of um, like the housing of the camera. They just can't fit that much technology. Um, I assume for within the larger sensor cameras, for the low end ones, they actually, yeah, they do handicap them. They don't give them the best autofocus algorithms. Um, and the higher end ones, they do. They give like, um, like professional level autofocus. And then Brian, yes, water column shots, right? So I see all these beautiful black water photos of like little larvae that um, um, people point out, hey, take a picture of that little baby um, um, juvenile squid. And like my camera is like, nope, I will take a picture of the silt that is on the housing. And then I get nice pictures of that. Yeah. But I also, I'm on a black water photo group and they have a TG4 or TG3 and these like amazing shots of like juvenile jellyfish with like a juvenile larval fish on top. And so, you know, I don't know if because they've taken a thousand photos or they're just really good. Boop. But I don't want to say that, um, I know, 
Ooh, I know. I want to dive without backstory. That'd be amazing. Um, but I also don't want to say large sensor cameras are perfect. Um, so one is that generally you're diving with a prime lens or a, um, and so because of that, you can't switch out mid dive. So either you are doing a uh, fisheye or super wide angle and you're doing close focus wide angle or you're doing a macro lens. And there are lenses that are sort of in between and can kind of do both. But in general, like if you are really focusing on like fish, a like crab things and smaller, and then a large barracuda comes by, you're not gonna be able to get that like um, really amazing shot um, that you would have with a wide angle lens. But with a TG6, you could quickly go to wide angle and take that quick snapshot of a larger animal and then go back to what you were doing. Um, and the other thing is that it is a much bigger rig. Um, my first dive actually with the Olympus and Micro Four Thirds system was at uh, Pierce Island, which was a really bad idea. Um, there's a lot of current um, and it was just really stressful and challenging. Um, and just holding onto my camera that was so much bigger um, was really hard. The, on the contrast, you can mitigate the, the weight of the camera just by using float arms. So like once you get in the water, um, it doesn't really feel that different from a compact system. So before you invest in a large sensor camera, I really recommend that you begin shooting in RAW. Um, I have plenty of examples of RAW photos that were like fairly terrible. And then Lightroom does its magic. I just learned about um, different uh, masking weight, masking things and the healing, tooth, healing brush, and you can make photos pop and be amazing. Um, and so shooting in RAW and then post-processing in something like Lightroom can really improve your photos. And then the other thing is you should, because like the strobes translate, like upgrade your strobes first, get really good lighting, and then um, it'll make the entry into the camera system a little bit less uh, crazy. So who do I think each camera system is for? Um, compact cameras, like if you want to enjoy the dive and take photos, I really think compact cameras are it. You take pretty good photos um, and not feel overwhelmed by the system. Um, if you're new to diving or if you're new to photography, um, a compact camera system can avoid task loading. Um, both for the quality of your photos, but more importantly, your own dive safety. Um, I think new divers, they, they want to go straight to like a new camera system. And I think a simpler camera system is safer for them. Or you just don't want to spend $5,000 to $15,000 on your camera system. Um, but if you're like, if you voted one or three in the very beginning and you're thinking about a bigger system, um, I think if you have the capacity for increased task load, um, you are either an experienced land photographer or you're an experienced diver. Um, I think that's like a safe bet that like, yeah, you should try, give it a try. Um, or if you really want photography to be the focus and enjoyment of your dive. And so I think there are folks that want to just sort of zen out, be present and enjoy the dive itself. But if taking photographs does make your dives more pleasurable, then I think the larger sensor camera will take away some of the frustrations of a smaller system. Oop, click. All right. So this is like a little bit of a mini Oh, data management. Ooh. Yes, a 45 megapixel camera. Dear Lord, that is turned on this. Um, yeah, um, hard drives are getting cheaper and cheaper every year. And so I think that's like a little bit less of an issue. Um, but like those file sizes are ginormous. Um, yeah, so this is something. Has anyone shifted their? I <laughs> just bought a new TG6. Um, yeah, are any of the ones and threes thinking like, oh, maybe I am like shifting to a three? Um, if not, we could just move on to show some photos. No, Chris, I think you moving from a GoPro to a TG6, you're going to find um, like it's just enough challenge with the new photography skills, but the quality of the videos are going to be like amazing. I can't wait to see the crab photos. All right. It's a little bit of photo gallery time. Um, so I have photos when I have a TG6. Um, I am now shooting with the EM1 Mark III uh, mirrorless camera from Olympus um, with a 30 millimeter lens. Um, I have a um, some bunch of strobes. I really like my big blue focus light, which is really, really clutch. It automatically will shut off when your strobes fire, um, which is great. Um, changed out my crappy clamps with some fancy ultralight clamps with a flex arm fiber float arms. And so here are some photos. So, um, so this is Pierce Island last year when I didn't die on the dive um, and was using um, a snoot to kind of like highlight the Organism. This is like in the last three minutes of the dive. I think Oslo pointed it out um, and it was big enough for me to see. So, um, yeah. Boop. and this is from a couple of weeks ago at uh, Port Constitution. Um, again, like I'm having some challenges like 
figuring out how to do the snoot right now. Um, but for me, there's like a little bit of, of the bouquet and then um, a lot more sharpness with the photos when you enlarge them. Um, this is a TG6 in Utila. I think this was like right off the dock um, at the dive center. And this ray was like just milling about um, on the sand. And I came right up to it to kind of take a picture of the eyeball. Um, and at the time, I thought it was really, really sharp. But now that when I look at it um, a couple years later, I realize like everything's a little bit soft and a little bit out of focus. But I just thought the eyeball covering was really neat that covers the pupil. Boop. Um, this was about a month ago um, with the Micro Four Thirds, um, the Shag uh, Nudibranchs on Fort Constitution. I think they're the most beautiful Nudibranchs that we have here. And uh, I'm not going to change my mind just yet. They're really fuzzy and furry, and I love them to death. Um, again, TG6, so you're able to like take pictures of this organism. I have other photos where I, I focused in on the eye. You can see the iridescence of the of the, uh, the cornea of the fish eye. Um, another nudibranch that Osla probably found for me because I can't ever find anything. Um, again, I think with the four thirds, you can. There's a lot more sharpness to the photos than I could not achieve on my own with the TG6. Um, squid shot from T6. I got lucky. Most of the time when squid come by, I can't get good shots. Um, between my not putting the strobes in the right area and the focusing issues that I've had, um, but this one was particularly friendly and I was able to get an okay shot of it. I think it was angry though. It's all red. Um, another shot, same little rank. I really like this one. Um, it's uh, boop. And so this is the power of the TG6 is that I was able to like take a photo and then the microscope mode, you can like see the cornea itself and all the different iridescence where the proteins were refracting the light. Um, and if you had a wide angle lens on the micro, uh, the mirrorless camera, you wouldn't be able to get the shot. You'd have to just like appreciate it and then move on. But with the TG6, you can take both kinds of photos on the same dive. Um, this is an out of focus. Um, serianthid that I took last year. Um, this is when I started doing underwater photography. I'm like, oh, I love this shot so much. Um, and then uh, a rando shot that I took a couple weeks ago. Um, again, I think it's just easier for me to focus and get a sharper image with the serianthid. Oh, uh, what was the distance with the, the eye shot? So this one was fairly close. I think I was probably about four inches away, three or four inches away. Um, and I think for some of like the really tiny things that you want to take a shot of, you'd have to be like an inch away and it's just really close. And so things like, I think they're called mucus worms that I want to take a photo of, um, but they're just really shy. And without the working distance of a longer macro lens, you wouldn't be able to take a shot like that. But for, com like, for sort of like very calm fish, you can really approach with a TG6. Am I reflecting? Oh, that'd be amazing. I should look go back to it. Um, yeah, so special thanks. I want to thank Tom. He answers all my questions. I have a zillion all the time. Asla for finding really cool tiny things. Sometimes I can't see them. Um, it's my Instagram. And I'm active on Facebook. So if you ever want to like, ask questions about, um, and you are also like large sensor curious, i um, happy to talk about why it's awesome. Uh, were you shooting with your autofocus? Oh, Tom, what do you mean for the, for that? Uh, I so my shot? question is, is um, cause I've, I've found both on the TG6 when I'm doing it, um, that you can select between like a single point of focus, which I like, cause it narrows mm -hmm. it down to like, I just want this eye or just want this edge, or it, you kind of let it like more intelligently figure out the entire frame. You know, um, do you, do you have, does everybody still have the same trouble between, um, cause I'm almost always on the single point of focus. So I don't run into as many um, focusing problems as I thought I would. So I wasn't sure if others were running into the same kind of thing or what the experience was. Yeah, I always use single point because that's how I shoot normally with my, um, my like full frame camera and then just like recompose that way. And so it might not be the best way, but that's how I shoot as well. Um, I like getting to the thing that I want um, with the mirrorless um, because it's much more easy for me to change the autofocus point. You can customize the layout of your autofocus points. Um, I'm now like actually manually selecting the focus point that I want. Um, on that system for, for the others that are using like the tg6 or tg5 um do you does anybody have any idea just how much i, I haven't been able to find this because it's a it's a point that when i brought it up i was like huh, that's interesting 
is how how wide you know we we talk about a single point but you know like on some of the dslrs and the um uh, even on the micro four thirds and stuff is that you have the option of like oh i'm going to do it nine points or 12 points of focus or 54 points of focus or 170 points of focus um any does anybody have any idea what what's happening with the tg because i'm curious because that's it's I'm, i i think it's wider than the single point which is why we're having trouble you know like uh... that scatter floats out and bam it gets us as opposed to it truly is a single point, but I, I actually don't know that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so like the little green box is actually not indicative of the sensor. It uh, might point. not be, it might be the center of several focus points. I don't know. That's that, I was just mm -hmm. curious as to what running in because it'd be nice to be able to figure out a hack to that, you know, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, I think Chris had his hand up. <laughs> Hi, Chris. No, I was trying to clap and I raised my hand by accident. So <laughs> I um, would like to say this is a pretty good presentation. I like this a lot because I actually moved from a compact camera to a micro uh, to a, I guess we'll call it a, a small full frame, which is you know, one of the Sony uh, cameras. Um, one thing I do want to bring up that with my full frame that I do a lot as a interesting hack is I use I have a button that crops my sensor. So I actually, as I'm diving, I actually take my full frame sensor and I crop it during the dive uh, to actually give myself an additional um, kind of macro effect. Uh, plus it makes it much easier um, to single in on images uh, in my viewfinder. And um, in that way, I kind of I'm kind of skirting both the benefits of of both systems, but not all the cameras are actually do that. And if they do, they do it in different ways. Um, I've actually thought very much. You know, there's times that I wish I had a TG6 uh, because you know I do get frustrated with my my larger camera. Um, but then again, it does have a lot of smarts, so I don't need to play with all the bells and whistles. But I, I thought this presentation was great, and I think it's exactly what people need to hear, because it's it's not the camera you shoot; it's that you actually shoot photos, and you learn you learn from that and get the gear that works for how you dive. The most expensive gear is not the best gear, unless unless you want to be a professional and you want to you know be able to get the same image every single time. Hmm. So. Well, I, I agree, Dale. This was a, a great presentation because it really is. It, it addresses something that I know a lot of people um, are, are thinking about. I mean, some are, are happy, which is fine if they're shooting uh, with a compact camera, but other, others entertain the thoughts of, you know, should I change or should I get a, a four thirds or a full frame? But I, I could add one thing to what Ed said. You know, yeah, the the larger camera is a little more of a of a hassle, but like any anything with with diving, the more you use it, then the the more comfortable you are with it. And then what was always uh, or what had been um, a little more difficult to use, or that you had to think a lot, um, that, that all that stuff goes away. And I know mm -hmm. that when if I have, have a new a new camera setup or I'm trying something uh, a new lens, then I'll just plunk myself down in front of something that I know is not going to move. You know, shoot an anemone or shoot a sponge, and then I just fiddle around with the the camera and the housing just to be able to get used to it. So then it becomes uh, a question of habit rather than having to think about it. And uh, but so I guess it, in short, it, it's just. The passing of time it will make using any kind of a system, whether it's compact or a complicated system. Uh, once you get used to it, then you don't even think about it anymore. I want to get. They to don't point. get lighter. No, they definitely don't get lighter. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't wait for you, like Honduras. Actually, they, <laughs> they make it heavier. I don't know. My tanks, my camera equipment. I am pretty sure they're getting heavier. Well, it's just, it's a goal. To, it's to <laughs> make you stronger, you see. <laughs> um, thank you, Ed. It's, it was a great presentation. I, I, I'm hearing myself because I'm in two different uh, um,
things. Oh, actually, one second. I sorry. One Called second. schizophrenia. <laughs> I know. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be messed up. Like, okay. I'm, I'm two different people right now. I apologize. <laughs> oh, my God. I just want to say one thing. Am I, am I doing, doing this? I don't know. I think it's you, Oslo. I'm going to be you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to. Um, so I stopped sharing my screen so that. Um, we can see some cool photos from Andrea. Oh, Ian, thank you, Ed. That was terrific. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Andrea, okay. uh, who has some uh, short, cool shots from here from New England. Is it all? Uh, is it Massachusetts, Maine? Um, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Oh, and also New Hampshire. Okay, not Vermont though. No Vermont or no Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Let's I had to see. think of all the little hot spots I frequented <laughs> last year. All right, so what do I do first? Share screen. screen. Yep. So Andrew, as you pull this up, are, are you gonna get to the end of this and say, by the way, all these fabulous photos were taken with a pinhole camera? <laughs> and a flashlight. Right? I did. <laughs> you, I, you always pull these off. Many, many years, I just used the flashlight. Can you see the screen yet? Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, share. Okay. Better? Yep. Okay. Still good? Perfect. Okay. All right. So um, this is all of New England, um, everything but. Vermont and Connecticut. Um, I'm shooting with um, a TG4 and I just recently got a new, a, an extra, it's not new, an, um, an additional strobe, but all of last year was using one strobe and two of the solar video lights, one at 2,500 and one at 2,000. And one had that little spotting light, which I never used. I usually just use the wide part of that. Um, and as you can see, I did use an eraser for my fiber optic cable. So um, I would say my budget is um, zero to little dollars. So I keep it pretty basic. Um, I enjoy the dive, but I really love taking photographs. Um, so the way I broke this down was I, I'm going to do a section of nudibranchs and then we'll go into some of my favorite fish and just go down the line. Um, this I took at Folly Cove and um, shooting white objects underwater is difficult, but I just like the way um, the little rhino fours uh, lit up with the yellow. And then you can see in the background, there's a little isopod or something creeping up over the kelp and right on the bottom too. So it was a really tight area. And with the one strobe, I was able to get into that. Now that I picked up the extra strobe this year, I'm noticing a little bit of a limitation on how far I can get into some of these cracks, but it's really not much of a big deal. Um, this here, I love, um, we were finding pretty much the same sort of white dendronotus frondosis um, at about 75 feet at Pierce Island. So this sort of shows like it was kind of dark down there and you could just see the light reflected and uh, get some of the nice detail in the rhino fours and even like on the, uh, on the head part and there's some like wrinkles and um, on the bottom, you could see where he munched down some of the pink hydroid. Um, these guys are so difficult to get, again, white, but I uh, just like the way the, um, the rhino fours picked up a lot of the detail and you could see him creeping up over the, the little pieces of seaweed looking for a meal. And um, this is a dodo formosa. Um, 
and it didn't really get washed out um, because of the white and the strobes. I must have had it positioned perfectly that day. And it just shows it um, creeping along like there was trillions of these tiny muscles. I believe this was at um, Lane's Cove. And then you can see in the background, uh, pretty blurred out skeleton shrimp. Just checking out what was going on. And this again, um, it was an area of dodos at Lane's Cove. And this one here almost had like a gray tinge to it. And I just love the way that, I don't know what you call that section around the rhino for, but um, it's like a little bract and that really lit up. Um, and here are the virilis that we were talking about earlier. Pierce Island used to have, I don't know about hundreds, but a lot. And this year we haven't been finding them, but last year there were quite a few. And I just like the way this one was holding on to the stalks of the pink hydroids and eating the top part of it. And you could just see the underfoot and all of the detail. Um, same species. It looks like a skirt just going across from each of the stems that it ate. And now it's going to devour that hydroid down. Um, this I liked a lot. Um, you could see how the current pushed the hydroids over. So it's like upside down. And then the serrata has like a frosting to it. So it really, the colors just really look nice on this particular one. You could see the detail of the foot and the mouth underneath. Um, Andy said, just pick 10 of my favorite photos, but it's pretty tough when you have, I took 6,500 last year. <laughs> so it's like less than a percent. <laughs> it was just too tough. Um, this is a Tenelia gymnata used to be Cathona gymnata, so name change. And this thing, it's probably, I'm gonna guess like two millimeters or maybe three, it's very tiny. And it was, um, it was in a tough spot, but it just came out perfect to me because you can see the detail on the, um, on the serrata and the inside little glands. Um, Andrew, were you, Andrew, were you on um, microscope mode on that or? Yeah, I, I'm, I usually go from the program mode on the TG4 to microscope. Um, if it's real, if I'm deeper and it's very dark, I'll go on aperture priority. Uh, but mainly it's just those two modes. Um, and once in a while, if I, um, if something isn't looking good, I will try the underwater mode and it just gives it a little bit of color automatically because this is all shot in JPEG. So when I get back to the Lightroom um, program, there's not much option for me, you know, cause I'm shooting in the JPEG, but that's why I'm down there for like two hours shooting hundreds of photos <laughs> opposed to having a larger camera, perhaps better camera and shooting less. Um, I rented a TG6. So this photograph was from the TG6 and I took it to Pierce Island. Um, I lost my fiber optic cable. So this was shot with just the video light that day. Um, I did like the TG6 a lot. Um, this one here was also shot that same day using the TG6 in the video light. Um, and I just like the way these Flabellina varicosa were like, looks like they were milling around in a circle, going from little food stop to food stop. Um, and this little, I believe this is a Flabellina varicosa, but it was very short. And it looked like he was coming up out of the seaweed trying to imitate the virilis. And he was going for his little pink hydroid and it looks like there's some little shrimps on there too. 
Um, and here is um, some nudibranch egg strings. I'm not sure on the species, but typically you'll just see one. Um, this one was a little extra special because you could see it's like a real, real ribbon looking and um, it's stuck around for two. So it looks like a um, petroglyphs. <laughs> it was on a nice piece of flat. I don't know if that was a brick. That was at Pierce Island as well. Um, and this one, mm -hmm. this was a tough shot. This was the first time I ever found this uh, nudibranch. It's um, Penagera. So it's Thecacera Penagera. And I've been diving for a little over 30 years and I never found this one. And I found it at Fort Wetherill and it had to be two to three millimeters. And I just, honestly, I don't even know how I found it. I just saw something like sparkly um, because this piece of seaweed that it was on was just moving back and forth um, because it was a little bit of surge. Um, and you could see there was actually two there but it's got just a beautiful detail. Um, it's got these little appendages around the gill in the back and it's got that sheath around its uh, rhino fore. And I'm sure if I had a decent shot, you could see more of the detail of this little animal. Um, there's just trying to show it. Um, it's not like a great photo, but these were like my favorites. And just by this being the first time it was like, crazy. Um, and here's another first for me. This was the tricolor up in Eastport, Maine. I've been looking at for them for the, I don't know how many years since I've been going up there. And um, this trip, we saw a few of them. And they, they are very pretty. Not too small, maybe six millimeters. And um, there were a lot of firsts last year at Fort Wetherill, and this is an Eplipsia. I'm not sure of the species, but um, it has, it's a mollusk, and it actually has a shell underneath that parapodium, so it, it'll open up, um, sort of to propel itself. It's a very odd animal. This one was probably three inches, it was quite large. Um, this here was probably six inches. This is Aplipsia fasciata porit. And this had to be, I don't know, it, it was giant and it would outstretch in this parapodia. I mean, I couldn't really get, um, get a decent picture of it. You could see I'm at Fort Wetherill. Um, I think I caused a little bit of the backscatter from excitement, um, but that's what it is when the parapodium opens up. You can sort of see where the shell is. And I have some pretty decent video of it, of it just moving extremely fast for an animal that I wouldn't expect to even move. And it was covering a quite a distant area and it would just shut that parapodium and then open and flutter. It was like a butterfly. So the width of it, my guess is like four inches wide and I don't know, six inches long or perhaps longer. And that's the tail. Like I said, I couldn't really get this whole thing in, but the video shows it enough. Um, and this is um, a sacoglossum, um, Placidia dendritica. And these guys are kind of tough to shoot for me anyway, but this here I got like some detail on the rhino for uh, the digestive glands you can see throughout um, the serrata and on its body and sort of its mouth area. And here was the, the holy grail of all times, um, Alicia clerotica. Um, Timur shot, shot these down in this polluted part of the Seekonk River in Providence. And I actually went diving there to see if we could find them and had no luck. Uh, we searched around different locations in Mass in New England. And uh, Jake found this at um, the, the University of New Hampshire Pier. And 
At first it was closed up. The, this again has like a paracodium too. And it just looked like some skinny little snail. But as we were diving, we saw a lot that day and it, it, it would open up, but you'd have to be so fast and so quiet trying to get that shot. Um, most of them were on the sand. This was in a very odd spot. It was crawling along um, some seaweed. And I just happened to look down and it was very sparkly and shiny with the little dots on it. Um, you could see like it's got digestive tracts going through its body. And um, it's just, to me, it's beautiful. <laughs> After three, two and a half, three years, I finally got to see one. Now we're moving on to the, like this fish. I don't really take a lot of fish photos because they move, but this guy is one of the few that are um, up in East Port, Maine, the wolf fish. And um, it's almost a guarantee at one site. So it was pretty nice. I have tons of photos with the silt and all of that, but this year it was um, pretty good visibility that day. I would have to say most of my favorite photos in this whole group are typically dives that had decent visibility, unless I caused it. Um, this here, I absolutely love the color of this rock gunnel with the, um, the light pink blood star behind it. Um, and the detail came out pretty good. You could see his skin and little dorsal fin. Um, this here was with Jake. We went on the left side at Fort Wetherill and it was amazing visibility that day the four there. And um, he spotted this giant uh, file fish. And this is a puffer fish from Rhode Island. The ones that we were finding up in Mass were very skittish. The ones in Rhode Island, you can shoot head on, side angle, um, from the back and all that. And I just like the way this um, had a lot of the detail of the, the face and the eye and the skin. And I just love this. We were kicking out at Fort Wetherill and we were just heading out on a mission probably to find uh, mantis shrimp. So we were going kind of fast and I just happened to look back up against a rock and this uh, file fish was there and he, he looked stunned. Uh, he was very cooperative. I was able to take quite a few pictures and he never moved. He, it just looks like camouflage the way he was set in there. And you could see that the visibility was awesome again that night. And then here's another first. This was, um, pretty much where I found that Thecacera pinagira nudibranch on, at Fort Wetherill. And this is a Blenny. It caught my eye because it was so shiny and sparkly. It's, um, I believe it's a seaweed Blenny. They're, I guess, pretty popular around New York, Long Island, but I guess we're not that far from there. And I'm not sure if there were two, but I noticed just, this week when I was putting this slideshow together, there's the tail of another one, unless it's his tail that looped around, but I don't think they're that big. But I always hoped he had a friend, so we named him Mr. Blenny. And um, here was a goat fish, which I haven't seen for years at Fort Wetherill, and it was so colorful. Like I didn't do anything really to that picture. Um, it was just very shiny, of course, he was sort of shy, but that's just a close up of the color on that fish. Um, again, and it wasn't in um, underwater mode. This was just, I don't think any of these photos are in underwater mode. These were all just macro or uh, program. And it was the year for octopus, um, tons and tons of octopus there. Great shots. These, I like these. I mean, I have a lot with okay, them. I'll fill in for a fill. Fitting, um, <laughs> I actually like these because. Yeah, they, I'm filled now. So then. Um, you could actually see like the, the way they're 
that I don't know what you call that, like the netting from arm to arm. And it was just moving along. I think we, we I was with this one. I think I was with Fung at least a half an hour, just observing it. And it was just, it, he didn't mind either. I believe it's a he or she. I would say more of a she. And that you could just see the motion once it wanted to take off and then it would stop and do its thing. I love the little piece of blue on his eye. And it's very weird. This thing, it looks smooth. And then all of a sudden it can, the same octopus can go to like a light beige with all um, like points and appendages all over its body. Oh, like that. Not a great shot, but it just shows you like the appendages yeah. around the eye, which is typically smooth. Um, and that's, I think, part of its arm. And sort of the piece of a siphon. Now this has to be my favorite of all time. It was in the beginning of octopus season. So I found this octopus and it was not that great visibility and it was seemed like it was very dark that night. And out of the corner of my eye, I kept finding a black sea bass. And a few weeks ago, I was shining my light on a box crab, which are adorable and a big black sea bass came up and ate it. So when I saw this black sea bass, I thought it was going to like attack this octopus. Well, it really didn't. What he, what I believe it did was he saw that there's a rock behind the octopus and he, I think he's imi imitating the colors of the black sea bass because it was regular brown and he didn't have the dark around its eyes. Um, and they were just kind of like hanging out for a while because I went along the dive and then I came back and it, they were still in sort of the same area, but a little bit further apart. Um, it reminds me of, I never even saw the movie, but Mr. Skellington, I guess it's a Christmas movie and it's a skeleton with a, like a baseball stitches on his mouth. <laughs> I don't know, that just, that has to be my favorite one. And this here, I was coming back from a dive, beelining it back to shore and I saw a, a, um, a snorkel with two eyes sticking up and it, obviously very tiny eyes. And when I came around the front of it, I noticed it was this tiny little octopus in the mouthpiece of the snorkel. So I only had like a split second because he gathered all the little shells that were in front of the mouthpiece. And then he grabbed that last Eastern slipper snail and he like slammed the door shut and not to be found. <laughs> so I just left him be, but that was, um, that's a pretty small octopus. Um, I have thousands of squid photos, but this was like in two feet of water. I mean, I know you can't get ambient light at night, but it's almost like it was ambient light because it was like hardly any silt up there. And he, he wasn't moving. He was, I think, trying to suck down the rest of that fish. Oh, great shot. And then the, these are the little squidlets or whatever you want to call them. Um, just cute, total cuteness. And you could see his little shadow that he made from my spotting light. And then the little hake on the bottom. There was like a time when the, the whole cove was littered in the hate and baby hake and obviously the baby squid. And this here, it was, I was meeting Asla for a night dive, but I went to Old Garden first and I timed it wrong. So my first dive turned into a night dive, uh, but that's when a lot of cool things came out, but I couldn't stick around because I needed to be at Back Beach for the night dive, but I just like the way it looks like it's getting dark and this guy was just squirming around, a lady crab. Trying to get the um, little tentacle off the crab, a uh, hermit crab. And this was just a little crab on a piece of kelp at um, the UNH pier. 
during the day. And this here is a lentil sea spider. Now I've seen them before, not too many times, but there were two here and it's actually carrying eggs. And it was in the same spot with the, the Tenelia, no, the, um, the Cassera nudibranch and the Mr. Blenny. I love wide angle, but not too often I can get it. And this is a giant cluster of sponge, finger sponge. Um, many, many attempts, but this here, something happened, it came out. And here's a polar lebid, leb, lebid, lebid shrimp, which are cryptic. I didn't realize that, but I was looking in Andy's app and they are cryptic. So he's sort of blending in with the mussels at Old Garden Beach. And here's a very odd shrimp. Another first for me, it was Fort Wetherill. Um, they call it pink shrimp or Farfintepineus doreum. Mm. Um, it's about, I don't know, four or five inches, my guess. Um, it's got that weird spiky thing on its head. And from the front angle, the eyes are on like little wow. dilts. But there's so much detail to these shrimp. I'm like, if I have a picture just of the tail and it's like that bright purple. Um, and they, they're not that shy, so you can photograph them. Um, we weren't finding many seahorses. I think one I found last year at Fort Wetherill, but Asla found this at the pier in New Hampshire. And you can see it's cleaner looking than the ones we photographed at Fort Wetherill. And this I just liked. It's um, a tiny slipper shell and it's a wavy astarte. So it looked like a little still life, like a platter of things somebody ate and left. Hmm. Here's the wall at um, Dawson at Eastport, Maine. And these are brachiopods. I absolutely love brachiopods. And the wall is clustered. And if anyone dives Dawson, there's this famous colorful Northern red anemone. It, it, it is that color. And again, not much wide angle, but this was under the pier at um, University of New Hampshire. Pillar. This was Fort Wetherill, a burrowing anemone. It's almost like it was such a murky dive and you could see it was sort of greenish, but, and then that was um, shining through, very tiny, maybe an inch. Close up of the Northern stony coral that's on the wall at Fort Wetherill, very unique. And I'm constantly trying to get the detail on these. So I, I think I nailed it on this purple sea urchin. Hundreds of shots, not so good. And that's it. Well, fabulous, Andrea, fabulous. Wow, well, well, what a collection of- uh, <laughs> It was what? tough to cut down. No, to no, ten. Just, you no, know, the 10. A wonderful collection of images from all of uh, New England. This is really yeah, terrific. New England, yeah. Wow. And, and, and some of these, I, you know, some of them I've seen that you've posted, but uh, there were a lot of new ones I hadn't seen before. They're great, great images. Wow. Yeah, quite a few from Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I, I got 80 hours of bottom time down there last year. Is that counting the day that it was 14 degrees at night time? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the day I got wet. <laughs> And I found that, what was that? The sea cucumber. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, was it a sea cucumber? I think it was, I think that's what you said, yeah. Wow, hey, wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was uh, terrific, terrific. Now we're going from murky water, poor visibility and silt to uh, 
heaven in the South Pacific. So, uh, Don, uh, uh, was it two years ago that you went there or was it last year? No, it was October. October, okay. So, Don, uh, Donald, I turn it over to you. Eager to see uh, what the images. I've been seeing some of them, uh, as I'm sure others have uh, on, on uh, Facebook, but wow. Well, I will try to. Hmm. I'll try to make the slideshow go. <laughs> Are you clicking on the from beginning on the left? Oh, thank you. That's and what Don, I'm forgetting. That, you should just title this the worst picture I took while I was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one? No, I have some bad ones in here because, it's, you know, it's important to show you it all. Um, so anyway, um, I kind of want to, something that Ed said is, um, I want to mention about task loading. So for many years, I've been wanting to go to um, see and photograph whales. Um, a lot of you know me, and I almost only do wide angle. I don't have any patience for the little things, and I can't find anything, like Ed said. Um, so uh, wide angle is my thing, and I have always wanted to see a whale, of course, who wouldn't want to see a whale. So, um, but I think that this, and I haven't been able to get on any of the trips because before COVID, um, it was very hard. It was hard to get on, um, hard to get on a Silver Banks trip. I really wanted to go to Tonga, and, um, but the Tonga trips, I didn't like how any of those were set up. Um, with a lot of people, a lot of day boats. Um, so in, I think in August of last year, um, Tonga, um, Morea opened and Backscatter had a trip going and I jumped on that trip and they limit to six people on their trips. And I think that this came even though I felt like I had been waiting for years and years and years and I was never gonna get there, I think this actually came at the right time. Um, I now have a really good camera system that I love and I'm very comfortable with. Um, I've been diving for many years, so I'm comfortable in the water. So I think it actually came at the right time in my uh, underwater photography, um, history, this is a good time for me to go. Had I gone sooner, I probably wouldn't have gotten the shots that I got. Um, so anyway, um, it's, where is, I hate that zoom away. I have to move the ribbon around. So you're in okay. presenter mode, if you wanna exit that and turn off presenter mode, then the, the screen on the, the next slide stuff on the right won't show up. Oh, can you guys see that part? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. The other thing is to... to Where's presenter know. mode? <laughs> so you need to exit, need to exit slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And slideshow. Okay. And then um, right about two thirds of the way across was where it says monitor and there's a checkbox under use presenter mode. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, there you go. thank you. Yep. Okay, there. So Morea is in French Polynesia. Um, that I did not take that picture. That's from Google that, that uh, one that looks like it was shot with a drone. Um, this little um, V-shaped island is Morea. That bigger island is Tahiti next to it. So that's where, that's where it is. Um, and every year 
from July through the beginning of November, the humpbacks from Antarctica come up there to give birth and mate. And um, they wait for the babies to get strong enough to swim back to Antarctica. Um, and you can find them, you can see them. Um, when we got off the plane and we were driving, um, we, were dr we had to take a ferry to get to Morea. And we, when we got to off the ferry, we were driving to the resort, um, they pulled over at a viewpoint overlook and there was a mom and a baby breaching and splashing all around. So um, me being a pessimist, I said, I said to myself, and I really mean this when I say this, um, knowing how mother nature is, if I saw a whale underwater and didn't get a picture, I would have been thrilled. But I really wanted just one picture. Um, and so when I saw them jumping, that gave me some hope. And the dive guide who was with us, he said, oh, you're going to see, you're going to see lots of whales. And I, and I didn't really believe him, but um, it turned out to be true. Um, so diving with the whales is prohibited. This is a snorkel trip. Swimming in the lagoon waters, the lagoon is the light green in that picture there. Um, you're not allowed to swim in the lagoon waters with the whales, and sometimes they do go in there. Um, you can't chase after them in the water. You can't touch them. You're not allowed to free dive. Um, all the rules and regu regulations they have there are for the protection of the whales, and the guides are pretty good about making sure everybody follows, um, follows the rules. So this is my camera setup. Um, I shoot a Nikon D850 uh, with a Sigma 15 millimeter fisheye. And they recommended a 1.4 teleconverter because they said that a fisheye was too wide for a whale. And I had a really hard time understanding that. Um, they said that they were going to be too far away. and I just, I mean, those of you who know me, I shoot, I shoot, you know, crabs with a fish eye. I shoot, I shoot all kinds of little things with a fish eye, and I just couldn't imagine that I wouldn't need a fish eye for a whale. Um, and in fact, I really wished I had it on the first day. But then after that, um, I was glad to have the teleconverter, which turned it from 15 millimeters to 21 millimeters. Um, it's all natural light shooting, so no strobes. And because you're snorkeling, you, you want your camera to be just barely slightly negative. Um, you don't want it to be dragging in the water. So you wanna make your system as small as possible. And that's about as small as I can make my system. So on the first day we were in, um, we were in a boat and they basically drive around looking for this. They look for blows, they look for tails breaching, and we saw so much splashing going on way far out um, away from the island. But it was so, I mean, it looked, it was like cannons were going off out there. And it was obvious there were multiple whales. And then we could see dolphins jumping also. So our boat headed way out there. And um, this, is, this was what we saw when we got there. Now, I also brought a topside camera. So I had, I have two D850s. So I had one in the housing and I had one with a 200 to 500 lens on it. And these were shot at 200 millimeters. Um, so this was my first whale. Um, the way that they tell you to do this is you're supposed to wear a weight belt um, so that you can sink about 10 feet in the water vertically. You're not allowed to dive, so you have to just kind of sink down vertically. And then um, that's so that you can frame your shot. So that was all out the window with me. I mean, there was, I jumped in the water and this whale swam right up to me. He was like 
20 feet from me and he stopped and he, he inverted himself like this and he was looking at me and I didn't remember anything about sinking down or anything. All I was focused on was um, aiming my camera at the whale and trying to get a shot. Um, and I don't have um, the, the dive, um, the, the, the trip leader. He had the um, same system as me, but he had a, a viewfinder with a 45 degree angle on it. So he was able to frame his shots by looking down. Like for me to do that, I would have had to, I would have had to be down in the water and I couldn't sink down in the water. I was too excited. I couldn't get the air out of my lungs. It required too much thought. So I was basically holding my camera down as low as I could in the water from the surface and just aiming it and hoping, hoping that I, <laughs> that I got it in the frame. Um, but they stayed there. I mean, the whales, the interactions with the whales are completely up to the whale. Um, these, there were three of them in the water at the same time um, and five, five or six dolphins. They were all playing together. We had to actually wait for them to calm down before they would let us get in the water because they were too crazy um, when we first got there and it was too dangerous. So once they calmed down a little bit, they started swimming right up to the boat. And when they started swimming up to the boat, they let us, they let us get in the water. So we slipped into the water and then, you know, I just, I just started <laughs> trying to get a picture of them. So this was my very first one. And I apparently forgot to put my settings on here, but I think it's on the next picture. Yeah, so this, these were all shot, this is the same whale at F8, one two hundredth of a second and ISO 100. Um, so that's, that's pretty, those are pretty basic settings when you're shooting wide angle and blue water, that's usually what your, what your settings are at. Um, so, I already told you this was uh, one of a group of three whales and the dolphins, and they were um, they were all playing. So once I I had my camera set before I jumped in the water because I knew once I got in the water I would have I wouldn't remember to to look at the settings. And I actually thought that I was going to cry when I got in the water if I saw them, <laughs> and I didn't. And I didn't cry then. I got a little bit weepy when I looked at my first picture and, and I had a picture of them then I got a little weepy after that. Um, so this whale is spy hopping. And this is one of the three whales um, from the first encounter. Um, they invert themselves vertically like this. It can also, usually they stick their heads out of the water, but it's also considered spy hopping when they do it just under the surface. And this was so that he could get a better look. And, and um, I mean, he just, he just sat there staring, staring at me and um, he spun around slowly. Um, on your camera settings, you have to, you have to use continuous autofocus. If you don't, you're not gonna, you're not, you're gonna miss focus on them, especially when you can't look through the viewfinder and you're just aiming the camera at them. Um, so you really have to use continuous autofocus. And I don't think I missed a single shot with it on, uh, I, at least not for sharpness reasons. Um, I can't use the LCD screen um, when I'm shooting big animals because there's too much shutter lag on a DSLR. So um, that's why I was shooting blind because I didn't want to have, I didn't want to compose the shot and then have shutter lag and have the whale, you know, move while I was while waiting for the shutter to fire. Um, and then these, apparently I did change the setting to F7.1, one two hundredth of a second, but it's pretty close to being the same thing. Um, another challenge that I started to think about later in the week was the where the sun is um, because the whales know where the sun is and they position themselves so that um, you can't well they think that you can't see them because you're looking into the, into the sun so um, I wasn't thinking about any of that on the first day 
So these are the things that I learned on the first day is be mindful of where the sun is. Um, if you're shooting in the direction of sun, you have to change your settings a little bit. Um, so in the beams kind of wreaked a little bit of havoc. Um, I know they look kind of cool in this picture, but um, really hard to edit. Really hard to edit these, these pictures with the sunbeams. So this is that same whale that came even closer and just sat there looking at me. Um, one of the benefits of not looking through the camera was that I was looking at the whale and shooting blind. So I was seeing at the same time, I wasn't behind the camera. So um, that was one of the benefits. Um, but I will never, ever, ever, ever forgive myself for cutting off his fins at the bottom. I'm, I'll never live that down. <laughs> And then he, then he slowly turned and swam away. So that is a rough tooth dolphin. All of these pictures are still from the first day. Um, you can see here what I was um, talking about with the sun. So I was really shooting into the sun. The sun was hitting the whale and, and um, the dolphin. The dolphin's a little bit blurry. Um, because right when I jumped in the water, this was what was going by me. And this is what was going by in the other direction, but down about 50 feet. So you can see this is a terrible picture, but I like it because you can see what was happening. I mean, all of these whales, these three whales and these five dolphins were all in my frame of view at the same time. And I couldn't get a shot of all of them together. Um, and because I was shooting straight down and you see the beams, I mean, this was really the best that I could do with the edit. Um, Tom Gately might be able to do better because he's a better editor, but this was the best that I could do. So this whale is a singer. Um, one of the, so this is now the second day and the way that you normally do it when you don't see a whole bunch of whales jumping around on the surface is you drive around looking for blow for blows from the whales and the whales will most of the time be sleeping or resting on the bottom in 50 or 60 feet of water and then they come up for a breath. So you look for the blow and then when you see their tail invert and they dive down, then you know they're going back down to rest. So they drive the boat over in the vicinity of where they've gone down to rest. They send a whale spotter in the, in the ocean to look for the whale. And when he finds it, then he tells us to jump in the water and we swim over and we wait. And we just wait until the whale comes up for another breath. And we hope that we position ourselves in the proper location, in the proper direction for the whale, for when the whale comes up. So this one was a singer and only the males sing. But as soon as I got in the water, you can like, you feel the vibrations in your chest from the singing. Um, it's, it's really loud um, and it's pretty amazing. So I was obviously positioned in the wrong spot when he came up for a breath, but I still, I still like this picture because this was one of the days that the water was really flat on top um, and it's kind of reflecting. Oh, Don, there's a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. I can't see the chat because I have to keep moving these around. Let me see. Question. It's from Tom. Yeah, I'll uh, really ask so, yeah. so, no. Um, so, we were going where they were, and most of the time where they were resting. 
um, and waiting for them to come up for a breath. Sometimes they were in pairs and sometimes they were singles. The singers were usually by themselves and, um, and then we would see them in pairs also. So we didn't have, I don't think we had any occasion where we were just happened to be in the water and a whale came by. Um, we had to go looking for them. I was just wondering with all the kind of the interaction with people and the whales, whether or not they're kind of like they're tired of you and they start to swim away from you or if they just basically like, oh, we're used to them and stay in kind of the same area. It really depends on the whale and if they're curious or not. So um, so one of the so they have day boats there also. And the day boats do like morning trips and then afternoon trips and but they have like 30 people on the boat so there were a couple of occasions where we went over by where the day boats were because there were whales there but um you know i hated it i hated it and i said you know i want to leave and they're like what do you mean you want to leave there's whales here and i said but there's too many people I, you know, there were people in my shots, there were people everywhere. You're trying to jockey for position because everybody wants to be in the right position. And, and uh, I said, I want my own whale. So, <laughs> so we left and went to look for my own whale and uh, we found mom and baby. And in another thing, so there were supposed to be six people on this trip. One guy from Ecuador, they wouldn't let him into the country because Ecuador was like a level four with COVID. And so they wouldn't let him in. My friend who was supposed to go broke his collarbone. And so he didn't go. Um, there was something happened to another guy. And then there was one other guy with me. And after that first day where we saw three whales and all those dolphins and had all that action, he said, he was going home because he wasn't comfortable. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it, but I was the only guest. So it was me, the trip leader, and the guy who spots the whales in the water. And so wow. it was pretty fantastic. And you know, we all know as divers, we never get that unless you're a bazillionaire and you can pay for a private <laughs> And all, and all the poisoning of the other participants was just pure accidental, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice job. Way to arrange that. Yeah, yeah. Very good. <laughs> no, I mean, I was pretty That's what I wanted you to talk about. Not the whales. People. How did you get rid of the other participants? <laughs> no, and you should see the boat we had. I mean, so it was, it was, it was so great. <laughs> I can't even tell you. So anyway. We did go. Don and days. Putin is celebrating their first year friendship on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the so the first day was the like the best um, day, and then we actually had three days where, like, I got that shot of the singer, but I got like no other very good pictures. Like, I saw whales in the water every day. And still, I was very grateful, but no more pictures. And so now I'm back in my pessimistic mode and I'm like, it's okay. I have pictures from the first day. I don't need any more pictures. And the trip leader is saying, yeah, but we got to find the mom and the baby. And so we spent like three hours. It was this mom and this baby. And we could tell because this baby is very, very tiny um, compared to some of the other ones. And we tried for hours, we were waiting for them and she would not let us near the baby on the first day. Um, she was having none of it. Like she was right near us, but every time we went in the water where she was, she was moving. So she wasn't just going down and sitting there. She was going down and then moving someplace else and then coming up for a breath, like way far away. So. There's a lot of swimming on the surface. Like we don't just get back on the boat and move in the boat. We were swimming all around the ocean following the whales. Um, so you do have to be in a little bit of good shape. I was okay. I didn't die. So, um, and I also lost my weight belt like after the first day too. So anyway, um, 
So then the next day we saw them again and the driver said, well, do you want to try again? Because we thought she wouldn't let us near them. And she was different on this day. So on this day, she was fine. The baby, the babies have to come up for air like every um, six, six to eight minutes or so. And the, and the big ones can stay down for like half an hour, 20 minutes to 30 minutes before they have to come up. So they would go down and the baby would rest like right next to the mother on the bottom. And then he would come up for his breath. And when he came up for his breath um, on this day that we saw them, um, he was very, very interested in us. And he's much bigger in person, like when he's right next to you. Um, so when he saw us, he started making a beeline for us. So now the challenge was letting him come close enough to get a really fantastic shot without getting run over. Um, our guide told us that the babies, when they're, when they're this young, they're just trying to figure out their bodies and what their bodies can do. And I mean, he was a maniac, this whale. He, he, was, he was chin slapping, tail slapping, like just full breaches out of the water. And then when you got back in the water, he would like look at you and then make a beeline. Um, he swam upside down a lot. Um, you can see all of the splashing there. Um, really hard to edit. <laughs> edit pictures when um, you've got all of that water. So, you know, usually we're challenged by backscatter and I didn't have backscatter, but I had all the, all the air bubbles in the water from all of the splashing. I think you um, nailed this one. It's beautiful. Oh, thanks. I, I don't know. <laughs> stunning. I was just, I really was shooting blind, but I mean, I'm sort of, I mean, you have to understand I've been shooting sharks and manta like wide stuff for years um and i'm kind of used to just aiming and shooting and i know how close i have to be to get a shot um that just i think that just comes with experience um but also i mean also some luck too i mean he was he was a little bit curious with us and then I started squealing in the water because I was just like, oh, you're so cute, you know, doing that kind of thing. And he heard me, he whipped his head around and he came straight, straight at me when I started squealing. So then of course the other two guys start squealing to make him come over by them. So, so we were with this baby for, I think two hours in the water, just, shooting and shooting and shooting and and hoping when the mother would come up we were trying to get the shot of the mom and the baby together but you know she wasn't really interested in cooperating so this was like one of the times i made a noise and he turned around and was coming like straight straight at me This is, you know, upside down and you can see that's the, that's the trip leader and the, um, the dive guy is behind, is behind, the whale spotter is behind him. Um, but, you know, he was just goofy, upside down. There he's going by. I actually edited this and took, took the divers out, but then I put them back because I think it looks better with them there. This is one of the better shots of the baby because he wasn't making such a mess of the water. Um, also, I think I had to do a much higher ISO on some of these shots because um, it, the sky was black. We were having thunderstorms. So we were in the water during a thunderstorm taking, <laughs> taking baby pictures. Um, so here, I, I love this shot. It's not, it's not the greatest picture in the world, but I really love it because this is the baby trying to get the, this is the trip leader, he's trying, he's trying to play with him. 
And you can see the trip leader is like back finning as fast as he can before that tail flops over in front um, and smashes him. That's just another shot. There's, this is like the best shot of the mom and baby that I could get. Um, it, this was shoot, they were, this was a bit away. Like this was kind of off a bit. I wasn't as close. And um, also there was an area where the, the lagoon was emptying out into the ocean. And so the water was a little bit more turbid over there. So this was, that's where this was. I think the mom must have planned it that way. So this is the last day. And on the last day, which I actually think I enjoyed this encounter, which again was like two or three hours uh, with just the three of us, no day boats in the water with us. Um, we came across these two whales that were surfacing together and resting together. And when we saw them underneath, like. I call them the lovers because they were obviously a mated, a mated pair um, and they were so affectionate with each other. Um, they were always touching each other um, when they were down on the bottom. So this is in 50 feet. I had to turn it to a black and white because um, it, didn't, it didn't look good in color um, because, because they were down deep. And again, you've got the sun beams um, interfering. But um, these whales were gigantic. They were the biggest, I think they were the biggest whales that we saw all week. Um, and because it was the last day, I dared to get a little closer to them than I was on the other days. Um, so this is one of the times that they were surfacing together. Um, and they were really like synchronized swimmers and they didn't, they weren't concerned about us. They didn't really interact with us, um, but they didn't mind us being there either. This is another occasion where they were both coming up for air at the same time. Yeah, so this is one of the times that I, I was trying to get both of them like head on, but um, I had to shoot down and shooting down is always a problem. So I had to turn this one to black and white too. Oops. That's another one of them resting on the, on the bottom. This is my absolute favorite shot of the trip. Um, this was the closest that I got to them. I was probably maybe 12 or 15 feet from him. Um, and you can tell by the quality of the picture itself that I was closer. There was a lot less water between the lens and the whale. Um, so it's always better to get closer if you can without getting smashed by a whale. I did back up with, because when she came up and she turned, her tail was to me and I was looking at that tail. I'm like, oh crap, is it going to hit me? But so I did back up a little bit after. And this is them on, um, on the surface again. So with regard to editing these pictures, the most, the challenging part is the white balance. Um, so I didn't do a lot of global edits to these. I only did more local adjustments and I use Lightroom to edit my pictures. I don't really know how to use Photoshop. Um, so I did a lot of, of small local um, edits to take care of things like in this picture here, the highlight on that whale, the whale on top, um, to bring down some of those highlights on him and to bring out some of the clarity. And then the white balance is a challenge because you don't wanna go too far with it 
because then I had all of these like magenta puff balls in the water when um, like if you use the auto white balance feature. So I had to really tweak it. I used some of the Lightroom masks. Those came out like right when I was editing the whales, the ones where you can select the subject and select the, um, the sky or the background. Um, so I did use that, but you have to be really careful that you don't make them look weird, like they're not really in the water, like you pasted them into the water. So I thought that editing these was really, really a challenge. Um, and I spent many hours working on these pictures and then going back and working on them some more. So um, I think that's it. Yep. That's it. So I don't know if anybody has any any questions. Don, your images are absolutely stunning. Oh, uh, thank you. Wow. Um, and I just came back two weeks ago from Silver Bank, and I can't believe how jealous I am of what I see <laughs> here. I mean, you talk about uh, encounters for a couple hours. We would go in the water time after time, and as soon as they saw us, they left. Oh, you got one, one quick shot. Uh, so, boy, this and to have the boat to yourself, boy, that is absolutely what a treat! What a treat! And yeah, it, it all worked because you have some absolutely beautiful images. Thank you. I mean, I do a lot of kind of mental preparation for um, these kinds of um, photography experiences. Um, even uh, when I go, you know, when I go on a liveaboard, if they tell us that we're gonna be going to a site that has wide angle, like I really start to kind of picture myself in the water at the time and what settings I'm gonna use. And I try to remind myself, you know, wait, like, I used to always make a mistake where I, I took the shot too soon when the, when like a shark was coming at me and I'm like, Oh my God, there it is. And I take the shot, but like one or two seconds later, it's a better shot and my strobes haven't synced back up yet. Um, so I do a lot of mental preparation and try to remind myself about kind of the basic photography things. Like for example, one of the days I jumped into the water and I missed a shot of a whale coming up because I had my lens cap on. So <laughs> inside the housing. Ooh. So, you know, these kinds of things I try, I try to remember. I was furious, I mean, but I brought my vacuum seal thing on the boat with me. So I opened the housing, I took the lens cap off and, you know, it was fine. But, um, so I just think, I guess that's like a takeaway. If you're gonna go and shoot wide things, um, you know, really try to think about it. I always set this these settings here that you see, um, like F8, one two hundredth of a second, ISO, you know, depending on what kind of water you're in, I set, I set those and then it's like a starting point. Um, if you have a chance to look at your screen, you can kind of look at your pictures and see if you need to adjust those at all, but you, when you're shooting fast moving things, it's hard to remember to check. But um, at some point when you get a break in the action, if you look at that and then you can, you can adjust your settings, but at least with those settings, you're close enough that you'll be able to edit in Lightroom if you're, as long as you're close enough to what, to perfect, I guess. So you, you didn't bracket then, you just had one exposure. Yeah, one exposure. Yeah. Well, Ashley, you were raising your hand, I think. Me? Weren't you waving or something earlier? Oh, I don't know. But okay. maybe you read my mind because I was thinking I should totally take you to the pier in New Hampshire. Are there, are there whales there? <laughs> there are no whales there, but it, it is an amazing wide angle site it is under a pier there are like these structures like going diagonal all kinds of lines there are like all these um like lines coming down with muscles growing on them it is an 
absolutely beautiful site for a wide, wide angle photographer. And I'm not a wide angle photographer and my wide angle setup sucks. <laughs> I just want to like get people there to just take beautiful shots of that place because it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. It's a very easy, I, I have a feeling you don't do much short dives, but it's an easy I try dive. not to. I say that it's for peasants, but. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> right. Rosa, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut this uh, short oh. out. Okay. Uh, um, but one, uh, it's, it's been a long day for Whitney. She's here all day and she's still at the shop. So uh, I want to thank everyone. Don, that was fabulous. Ed, yours was thank great. You. And Andrea, also great. Uh, thank you so much, um, and thank you all for tuning in, and see you all next month. Thank okay. you. Yeah, that was great. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Whitney. Sorry to keep you up so late. I'm good. No worries. This is... Hey. This is normal these days. <laughs> Ellen, did you were you a little a uh, little jealous? Ellen? Um, um we saw whales. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have that kind of visibility? Well, no, it was a little different. Looked like it might have been a little warmer than where we were as well. <laughs> But we had some good encounters. Yeah, we, we, we did. Have, we didn't have three hours. <laughs> but I, I did think it was interesting um, that she talked about lots of day boats and everybody in the water at once, whereas yeah. Tonga is three people. Right. Right. Um, no matter how many boats are there, and only I think it, I think they said only two boats per whale. Yeah, they and, had and then you could. And then you couldn't have people from both boats in the water at the same time. So they seem to be maybe a little better regulated. All right, we'll put it on the list. Yeah. All right. Uh, Whitney, thanks. Thanks for oh. bearing with us. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, no sweat at all. I don't mind going, you know, till nine. That's fine with me. I'm here oh. for it. Okay. Awesome. Well, Bye. thanks for a great night.